from the capital city of Charleston, West Virginia, this is Inside West Virginia Politics with Mark Curtis. Inside West Virginia Politics is brought to you by AARP West Virginia, your ally for real possibilities in the Mountain State. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Inside West Virginia Politics. I'm your host, Mark Curtis, with my co-host, Adrian Robbins, and I guess the gentleman to your right needs no introduction, the governor of West Virginia, Republican Jim Justice. Great to have you on the program again. Thank sir. You yeah, thank Thanks you so much, me. Governor. Thank you. So I'd like to start out with uh, a big announcement. It's one that you talked about during the State of the State Address. Uh, Ramico Carbon coming to West Virginia and building this facility. Tell us about the importance of this. Well, it's jobs. It's high-tech jobs. It's really good paying jobs. And basically, you're going to have people walking around in white suits determining what can be the best use for coal, you know, and how we can make materials out of coal and market it without taking it, you know, and burning it. Now just imagine this, a barrel of oil is equivalent to a ton of coal, and that's what it is, okay? Now, here's the, here's the thing that you may, that may be difficult to understand is, is as far as carbon units, but from a carbon unit standpoint, coal is 30 times cheaper, 30 times. So therefore, what you could very well do is significantly raise the price of coal, significantly, which would give us more and more and more severance tax, and make this product significantly cheaper than you could do it out of oil, and it would absolutely, it's just, it's just limitless what could happen with this. In the beginning, they'll start out in Charleston here with probably 10 jobs, and that'll grow very, very quickly to 50, and it's their goal to go to 100. But in addition to that, in addition to that, Ramico has two sites, mining sites in West Virginia and a great big mining site in Wyoming, and they're doing all this research and everything in Wyoming. And so in addition to that, they're looking at right after that, doing a plant in Southern West Virginia that is the real deal. This is an experimental plant to learn what they can do. The plant in Southern West Virginia would be real manufacturing. Governor, we're going to get to the, the meat of the state of the state address in a minute, but I do want to get your reaction. Your attorney, George Terwilliger, was here this week and announced that he had been told by the U.S. Justice Department that you and your family members have been cleared of any wrongdoing in that investigation. Your reaction? Well, Mark, to just tell it like it is, here's the deal. You know, that went on for a year. It was brutally tough on my family and tough on me, especially tough on Jay and Jill's families. I kept telling everybody all along that no matter what you look at, there ain't going to be anything to find because we may make a mistake, but there's no chance on earth that we're going to do anything that we know is wrong to benefit ourselves. There's no chance. So they went through all kinds of different stuff and everything, and at the end of the day, they couldn't find anything. And I really, I could be, and it was horrendously expensive. And on top of all that, it was tremendously st stressful. But let me end with just this. I am very respectful of the job they did because they're there to protect us. Just me saying there's nothing there doesn't really mean anything, but really at the end of the day, they looked at everything and then said, we agree. So from that standpoint, there's surely a relief and a satisfaction, but at the same time, it was tough, really tough, really stressful. Have a lot of people look at you in a different way. It's not any fun, especially when you know you haven't done anything. So uh, glad it's over. Moving now to the state of the state address this week, uh, I, I've got to ask you, I've heard a lot of Democrats say that they felt like you painted too rosy of a picture of the state of West Virginia. Uh, do you think that maybe you are seeing it, especially the economy, through rose-colored glasses? Well, I would, say, I would say this to everybody, you know, look at my track record. Just look at what I've done. I mean, for crying out loud, look what I've done. I took over a bankrupt Greenbrier, it's on and on and on. I've done, I've done, and done, and done, and done, and done. Whether it be a basketball team, the Greenbrier, the Pinnacle Mine, no matter what it is, that's what I do. Sure, I look at it positively. I can't stand people that are sticks in the mud. But to think that West Virginia today is not rosy, I mean, compared to when I walked in the door, 
with $500 million deficits and a 4.055 budget. Now we're, we're, we're presenting a budget that's less than last year and, and we're getting criticized and it's $500 million higher than when I walked in the door. Got to ask you, was your favorite moment in the state of the state <laughs> was when you handed out all the orange vests? I got mine. <laughs> well, I, you know. We got a bunch of traffic cones in there last night. Good, and we're, we're knocking it out of the park. We're trying to take care of all the roads. And uh, I loved what the lady that cut my hair said when she said her brother, you know, drives on all these back, back, back roads. And he said, I don't know how anybody could be upset because they're even paving the roads I drive on. And so, so really, at the end of the day, uh, good stuff, good stuff. A lot of, we're getting a, we're getting a big bump from the standpoint of jobs. We're getting a big bump from the standpoint of we're, we're, we're really fixing our roads. All right, we look forward to working with I you for the rest of the. Back. <laughs> I think Woody Williams was the only one. All right, I'll give it back to the governor. Everybody knows I'm not running around with state property. Anyway, we'll have more of Inside West Virginia politics after this break. And thanks, Governor, for being uh, here. Mark, thank you guys so much. You guys are great. Now back to Inside West Virginia Politics with Mark Curtis. Welcome back to Inside West Virginia Politics. We're now joined by Senate President Mitch Carmichael. Thank you so much for being here. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be with Good you. Good to see you, you, Senator. Yes. Uh, well, one of the things the governor brought up in his State of the State address is something you've been championing for a long time, and that's repeal of the business inventory tax. Why is this such an important issue to the Republican leadership? Well, it's not just Republican leadership, Mark. This has been studied. This issue has been studied by governors of both parties, clear back to uh, perhaps even governors. Governor Underwood, Governor Manchin, Governor Wise, and put renowned economists to uh, review this process also and have identified this tax, this single tax, as the most job killing tax in West Virginia. Uh, I'm very aware of the effects of this tax because living in the border county in Jackson County, uh, the big aluminum plant that we had there in Jackson County, you know, we still have remnants of it. Constellium's doing great. But every border county, that we have. Every big entity that wants to locate in West Virginia must pay personal property tax on their very manufacturing equipment that creates the jobs and the opportunity for our citizens. When they can go just across the river into Ohio, into Virginia, into Kentucky, any of these places and, uh, and not have this tax. And it's a lot of money. It's roughly about $100 million uh, for spread out among all counties in West Virginia. And we think we can find a way to uh, backfill that money to the counties, make sure that our school systems are made whole and our counties are made whole, and yet get rid of that tax so that we can create the manufacturing jobs for West Virginians. How exactly do we make up that money? Because I know that's what a lot of people want to know, because that money does go to counties and schools. Yes. And how do you make up $100 million, especially when, from what the governor said last night, it kind of sounds like we're on the lightning bolt down a little <laughs> bit. We need to tighten our belts here. Well, uh, the governor's analogies are sometimes interesting. Interesting, and I understand that uh, while there's not a straight line trajectory upwards, we are on a glide path up uh, from our revenue. And so, how do we make that up? I think we do it by uh, making sure that we don't phase it out overnight, that we put it in a uh, a more of a phased out approach, maybe do it over four or five year period so that we send the message to the rest of the investment communities throughout uh, the world that West Virginia is getting rid of this tax. We're going to do it in a slow, responsible manner, four or five year period and allow the natural growth of our economy to backfill those uh, areas uh, that were uh, targeted for reduction. Another issue that you've been involved in that's made a lot of headlines uh, is the Fairness Act. Uh, a non-discriminatory act that would apply to the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender community in, in West Virginia. I, I don't want to mischaracterize your position. You're very open to discussing this and having it debated. I don't think you've flat out endorsed it yet. Where do you stand on it and why, why is this such an important issue to at least discuss? Well, it's an issue that's been brought forth in the, by various interest groups in West Virginia. And it's, uh, you know, there's a national trend towards that. And my faith, Mark, uh, teaches me to be uh, open and uh, respectful of people from all different uh, walks of life. So I come at this from a Christian perspective, just as some that oppose it come at it from a, a Christian perspective. But I realize that, uh, you know, we have to have an open society and so forth. But I don't think uh, at this point in time that it's the right path to pursue for West Virginia. I'm just, uh, I'm, uh, at this point, don't believe it's uh, uh, in the best interest of our 
our state uh, to pursue this. Now, I want no discrimination. I think you know we should all be an open, welcoming society, and we should love our fellow man and not uh, put artificial barriers in place uh, that uh, inhibit their growth and their ability to achieve. I mean, no one should be kicked out of their home or fired from their job because of uh, an orientation. But uh, having said that, this issue is before the Supreme Court of the United States. We expect a decision in the June time frame. And so I think it would be uh, premature at this point for West Virginia to step out in front of this issue. Let's just see what happens at the Supreme Court level and let's uh, re-energize our uh, uh, commitment to making sure that no one is discriminated against in West Virginia. I'd like to touch real quick on marijuana. Obviously, you know, medical marijuana going through, you said at the legislative look ahead that you felt like that program was on track. Mm -hmm. A lot of people feel like it's not on track. And then uh, there is a group that believes that maybe West Virginia should uh, think about legalizing recreational marijuana. Well, uh, we are a little behind in our medical marijuana implementation. You're right about that. Uh, we're, we're tracking towards getting it uh, implemented. And, I, and the reason we're doing it is because it was, became a very popular business because people, anyone that's suffering with some of these diseases, why would we stop them from getting something that could alleviate their suffering? No one should want to do that. Now, recreational, I'm not on board with that at all, and I don't believe we're, we're anywhere close to pursuing all right. such an action. It's going to be a busy year at the Capitol. Yes. Mitch Carmichael, Senate President, thank, thank you for joining you. us. Yeah, thank you so much Thank for you. Here. It's my pleasure. We'll have more of Inside West Virginia Politics after this break. Now back to Inside West Virginia Politics with Mark Curtis. And hey, welcome back to Inside West Virginia Politics. We continue our discussion of the 2020 legislative session now underway at the Capitol here in Charleston. We want to get the perspective of organized labor. Joining us is Josh Sward. He is the president of the AFL-CIO of West Virginia. Good to see you, my friend. Good to see you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you, too. I know it'll be a busy time. Organized labor has been very involved in the last several sessions. We'll get to some of those issues like right to work and prevailing wage. But overall, what are your hopes this year? Well, I'll be honest with you, we don't have much hope going into this session. We expect to be on defense from the get-go and stay that way throughout the entire session. It's a continuation of what we've seen since 2014. So, you know, I, I don't know uh, in what capacity well, we're going to see these attacks on workers, but I rest assured there will be some attacks on workers this legislative session. One of the big issues you guys are already coming out in opposition to is the re re removal of the business and inventory equipment tax. Why are you opposed to that? Because that's nothing short of shifting tax dollars from out-of-state corporations to hardworking and retired West Virginians. It's that simple. And they do it uh, in this frame in which it's going to generate all this economic development and opportunity, it's hogwash. It's the same argument we heard when they were trying to pass right to work or eliminate prevailing wage or you know, roll back more corporate taxes. It, it is nothing but a farce and we're adamantly opposed to shifting taxes that corporations are paying on the backs of hardworking and retired West Virginians. We're adamantly opposed to that. All right, you mentioned the, uh, the whole issue of right to work. That's coming before the Supreme Court in just a few days on January 15th. Uh, what is going to be the main argument of organized labor trying to get right to work overturned in West well, Virginia? Well, look, we already have a good ruling. Uh, Judge Bailey ruled in our favor. She, she believed our argument was the right argument, that it violates the Constitution in three different areas. So in a few days, we're going to go uh, have oral arguments in front of the Supreme Court, and, and we'll see what happens after that. If the court uh, does the right thing, then they're going to overturn right to work, and right to work will not be the rule of the land anymore. If they go a different direction, then we'll just look at different poli policy opportunities moving forward with the election coming up, and, and then, of course, a legislative session next year, which will have a whole new host of legislators, both House uh, members and Senate members. So. You know, we'll see. It's a very fluid time for a lot of different things right now, Mark. Obviously, the labor movement, the big thing the last two years was the teachers' strike. Uh, in two straight years, uh, the teachers and all state employees eventually got 5% uh, uh, pay raises. We should point out the American Federation of Teachers is a division Correct. or a subset of AFL-CIO. Any talk out there, and I realize this really falls in the heads of the teachers' unions, but any talk out there about another labor action from teachers in 2020? You know, I, I'm not real sure what, what we have heard are these concerns with where the budget is. Um, you know, there are, there are a, a host of different numbers floating around as to what kind of budget deficit we're going to have come year end. 
Um, and, if, and if history is any indication, Mark, you know, uh, this leadership team of the legislature has had a really difficult time handling iffy budget situations. And if it looks like we're pushing toward another situation where they're going to have to make cuts, one, we got to pay attention to where those proposed cuts are. And two, we're, you know, we're taking away the possibility of, you know, any more potential pay increases for public employees or, you know, something that we haven't heard much about recently, but just still but it's still a forethought of all public employees out there is PEIA. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that because yeah. we're down to about a minute, but they, you know, there was a proposal to permanently fix it and fund it. Uh, you, you're a board member of the PEIA. I was. I, or you were. So, yes. But you're still in tune to the whole process. Uh, is organized labor satisfied with what's done on PEIA or are you still waiting to see? I think, we ha I think we have some real reservations because they have yet to come up with a dedicated revenue stream. Actually, we're paying the bills with one-time money over at PEIA. It can't last that long. So, you know, we need a dedicated revenue stream. The other thing we're going to watch for this legislative session, uh, for some reason, uh, these uh, uh, legislative leaders want to come after the JOBS Act. And what the JOBS Act says is if we're using taxpayer monies on construction projects, that we should use local workers, provided they're trained, to do these construction projects. 75% of them actually in the JOBS Act. For some reason, the legislative leadership wants to remove that provision. I don't know what they're trying to hide. I don't know what out-of-state corporations they're trying to bring in or where these workers are going to come from. But we have plenty of highly skilled, qualified, and trained workers here in West Virginia, and we ought to be using those fo folks when we're using our taxpayer monies to build things. All right, we're going to have a busy legislative session, uh, including with organized labor. We want to thank Josh Sword, thank you, president Mark. of the AFL-CIO of West Virginia. Thanks for being here. We're going to see a lot of each other Appreciate in the Capitol. Happy New Year, brother. You too, man. All right, more of Inside West Virginia Politics after this break. Stay with us. Now, back to Inside West Virginia Politics with Mark Curtis. We are joined by Democratic Minority Leader Tim Miley, Democrat of Harrison County. Good to see you, former House Speaker. Nice to see you too, Mark. Thanks sure. for having me. Yeah, thank you so much for being here with sure. us. You're welcome. My pleasure. Obviously, the big news this week was the State of the State Address. I'd love to hear just your initial reaction to what the governor had to say. Well, number one, I want to start by saying that I didn't hear a lot of substance as far as a policy agenda and vision for the state of West Virginia. There were some things I did like uh, from what I heard, and that would include funding for um, some hunger crisis issues we have in our state. We have a significant amount of need in the uh, IDD waiver program because we have a number of people on the wait list, and those are very needy, vulnerable people in our state, and those people are going to be completely taken off the wait list and provided much needed services and funding. So those are some things that are good. But I didn't hear much about policy matters that's going to drive West Virginia forward, in my opinion. But my concern is that he painted a much rosier picture of the current state of the state than I believe currently exists out there in our communities. Well, let's talk about that. I mean, do we know how much money the state has? Because that's going to determine what we can spend and what the priorities will be. Well, I, I think they believe that we're only going to have a $33 million deficit in the current budget year, but the budget we will be preparing for the next budget year will be over $100 million less than what it was than when it was prepared for this budget year. So that just means that much less funding that, that's going into certain areas. And, and while it's still an issue, I, I'm more concerned, to be honest, Mark, about the lack of policy that's going to attract people to stay in this state and come to this state. Um, there are too many policies that we've passed in the past several years that didn't put West Virginians first. And I think we need to start putting West Virginians first because we are losing population at an alarming rate. Just in the past five years alone, we've lost 57,516 people. That's concerning to me. So to, quite frankly, it doesn't really matter what our state's finances are if everyone's leaving the state because they don't see opportunity here or they don't have any hope for a brighter future here. During the next 60 days, what kind of legislation are you guys thinking that could fix that? Well, there's no silver bullet, number one, so I want to make it clear that no one should believe there is ever going to be a silver, silver bullet. Never was, never will be. But some of the things we're going to do is invest in continue investing in education. That's the e best way out of poverty, number one, for families and communities. So we want to maybe extend uh, Votex uh, education to middle schools. We want to work on a Promise for All program so that we can extend the program that, that we passed last year that allows 
allows people to go to technical and community colleges to make four-year colleges more available. That may or may not be free tuition, but it certainly would make it affordable and accessible to them as a last dollar in approach because we need more of our people getting educated at all levels, grade school, middle school, high school, and college. The governor, Senator Carmichael, the Republican leadership wants to repeal the business and inventory tax. Your stance on it and what are your concerns? Look, we have concerns about the tax being removed. We, we think it's kind of a goofy tax. I don't quite understand why it was ever put on in the first place, but it's there. And that money that's collected goes to our counties to support our county school systems. If we remove that tax with no identifiable replacement revenue, and they haven't identified any yet, then what will be we crushed is our local school systems. And the only way to keep them afloat will be to raise your property taxes on your homes. And we live in a poor state with people who are retired on fixed incomes and can't afford to have that happen. We want to thank Minority Leader Tim Miley for joining us today, but we also have kind of a sad note to end the program. We have to say goodbye to Adrienne Aww. Robbins, uh, my co-host and co-anchor for the past year. She's been wonderful working with you down here at the Capitol and at the station. She's going on to the next star station in Columbus, Ohio. So any Ohio politicians watching this program might not look out. She's a sharp, uh, she's a sharp young lady, and she'll do very well. And we thank you and wish you the best of luck. No, these guys down at the Capitol have really become like family, and it's been a sad couple of days saying goodbye to everybody, but I appreciate you guys answering all my silly questions and <laughs> no, they're not telling silly me at all. where to go when I was lost many <laughs> times in this building, but it has truly been a pleasure. You should hear where they tell me to go when I'm lost. <laughs> Thanks, Adrian. God bless you and good luck to you. Thank, Thank you. you for watching Inside West Virginia Politics. Don't forget to download us from your favorite podcast location. We'll see you back here next week.